Hi, so today we're going to talk about socioculturalism, which is our last of our learning theories, and we're really going to think about the ways in which this learning theory is different from our other theories. Um, so let's continue. Um, so our guiding questions today are, what constructs does socioculturalism entail, and how do the constructs in socioculturalism relate to each other? So socioculturalism is really um, looking at um, learning through a completely different lens as our other different um, learning theories. This is coming from the discipline of sociology. So Rogoff, who was one of the founders of one of the great thinkers of socioculturalism, it was a sociologist. And she was really looking at the way children learned um, primarily from their parents and their mothers across lots of different um, cultural context. So across the world, um, looking at indigenous peoples, um, in addition to really modern um, Western families as well. So really trying to come up with a learning theory that um, encompass not just Western ways of thought, but um, would encompass um, the ways in which human beings learn. So the big idea here is learning um, is children in, as apprentices, I'm thinking, that they learn from observing and participating um, with peers and more skilled members of society con to construct new solutions within the context of sociocultural activities. So there's some really big ideas here. Um, and these key aspects of the socioculturalist theory um, includes guided participation and apprenticeship. So that idea that you're working with both peers and skilled partners. Um, that the cultural context is, is really important, that sociocultural context. Um, and what, what do we mean by cultural knowledge? And this cultural knowledge is important. So cultural context um, is the processes of sociocultural activity. This cultural context um, will differ between cultures and customs. So that this is what our learning is embedded in. This is what knowledge is embedded in our culture. And we can't separate those two. And then every group, every um, every place that you are, every context is really different. And so we could talk about macro cultures, like living in the United States um, or living in Florida or Texas. Um, and we can talk about micro cultures, like um, an individual family or a classroom or a school or, or a club or a social organization have um, unique cultures and customs. Um, and then these contain the tools of a culture, like unique language, even slang, or, um, or a more formal language like English. Um, and also our nonverbal cues are part of this language and the way in which we interact with each other. And this all becomes super vital and important to the ways in which we learn and how we learn things. And then the conception of what knowledge is and what we call cultural knowledge in socioculturalist theories is really different than the way that we've conceptualized knowledge in our other theories. So cultural knowledge doesn't belong to an individual. Knowledge isn't something that you possess, but it's less of a thing and more of a process. Knowledge is guided participation. It's being a part of a group. Knowledge isn't a thing that you have, like you don't know the capitals of the states, but in fact, you become a person that knows about these things that you're guiding and you're becoming part of a group of people that possess and that can do this skill. So rather than saying, I'm learning how to read, which would be a very Western way of thinking about reading, instead, I'm becoming part of a group of people that are readers that can do this skill. And, and that, that process of becoming a reader is a lifelong and ongoing process that I begin when I learn my letters and it, and it doesn't ever end, but I get better and better at becoming a reader. That makes sense. And I do that through guided participation, through interactions with my peers and with mentors. So let's look at this apprenticeship model that was um, designed by Roboff um, in 1990 would be the citation. So we have some sort of culturally valued activity. This is an activity that people want to be a part of. We have a novice, a person who wants to learn this activity. They're actively attempting to make sense of the situation. So they're responsible for being a part of this group. And they're um, responsible for putting themselves in this position to learn. And they have a skilled partner. And the skilled partner finds effective ways to, to achieve the shared thinking and stretches the less skilled partner's understanding. Um, and structure sub goals for that problem solving so that the skilled partner is 
developing an environment that can help the novice be successful. And there's two-way communication happening between them, and this communication is both tacit and explicit. So tacit communication are the types of communication that are not said but understood. So the way that I model my behavior, the environment around me, um, the way that I express um, through nonverbal cues might all be tacit communication. Explicit communication, on the other hand, is when I tell you exactly what I want or exactly what I'm doing. So explicit communication is, is a set of directions or um, a set of clear instructions. Um, so for example, um, if I was talking about the way in which we walk the hallways, if I had a elementary school students, as explicit communication would be saying, okay guys, um, first graders, when we walk through the hallway, we need to be really quiet, our hands are behind our back, and we're very respectful to each other. And we, we follow the person behind us so that we're in a line. Um, if my tacit communication would be um, when we walk through the hallways, um, that the lines are quiet and they're straight and everyone's following directions. If, um, if for example, um, we were walking through the hallways and it was really loud and kids were pushing and shoving and yelling and I didn't do anything, that would be tacit permission, tacit communication that those types of activities were okay. And in that case, my tacit and my explicit communication would be um, opposing, that I would be saying one thing explicitly but tacitly allowing a different type of behavior to happen. And that's not great, right? We want our tacit and our explicit communication to, to be the same. We also have supportive structuring. So this is the way in which we, we um, set up those sub goals so that we can um, allow our students to be successful. It also might be providing a safe environment for our students to learn or our novice to practice. And then we have that transfer of responsibility. So that's the idea that more and more our students um, take over the responsibility for that task. So in the beginning of reading, um, I might be asking them to recognize those sight words, but by the end, we're doing a guided reading activity where I'm asking them to look at the pictures and tell me what the story might be about. But by the end of them becoming a reader, they're doing all of that reading alone and silently in their heads, right? Um, but we don't do this, um, we don't make this journey to becoming skilled in a culturally valued activity on our own. We do it in a group, a group of novices, our peers. And these peer groups are really important. They become resources for one another and um, aid and challenge each other. And the book, I think, talks about how this is a um, community of practice. And we hear that a lot in the schools too. Community of practice is a way in which teachers or students might work together on a common goal become better or more resourceful at something. So that group of novices is a part of this apprenticeship model and really important as well. So that's the apprenticeship model. Let's look at an example. Um, so recycling at UNF, right? Let's pretend there's never been recycling before at UNF. And it's a culturally valued activity. We all want to get better at recycling, right? So we have you who's never recycled before. Um, you're a novice. And you have the UNF recycling coordinator, someone who's in charge of recycling skilled partner. And there's some communication happening, right? There's a replacement of recycling bins and there's direct emails to people telling them how to recycle or what to recycle. So the tacit communication is the placement of recycling bins. Just by putting out recycling bins, it is a communication we want people to recycle, right? And, and you can recycle. And then the email communication is explicitly telling people you can recycle here at UNF now. Um, we also have guides on what we can and can't recycle, right? That's supportive structuring. That's telling students and giving students support to remember, okay, you can recycle paper, you can't recycle pizza boxes, right? Um, and then we have less guidance over time. So we can reduce the number of recycling guides and the number of emails about recycling over time as, as we learn how to recycle as a group and I don't need the reminders anymore because it becomes part of my habit and I, I become an expert um, recycler. Um, a transfer of responsibility from, from the recycling coordinator to the students themselves. And there's lots of other UNF students um, and, and faculty and staff who become part of this movement, right, who are learning how to recycle with me. So, um, and that can become the form of peer pressure, like if I throw away a piece of paper, I might have my peer group look at me and say, and, and either tacitly or explicitly, um, condemn me, right, for, for not recycling that paper. Or I might go to them for support and say, gosh, I have this pizza box. Can I recycle this or not? Do you know? And um, I have, a, I have a, a group of novices, a peer support 
for, for becoming an expert at recycling. So that's one example of apprenticeship. What are some other examples of culturally valued activities that we could put into this model? I've already talked about reading and how reading is an example that we can become part of this group of people called readers that's valued by our society and that we model this both explicitly and tacitly. Um, teachers do when they're teaching kids how to read and, and we work with a group of peers and to a group of kindergartners and first graders learning how to become better readers, right? Um, student teaching is another really great example of, of having skilled partners welcome us into a world of and a group of, of skilled teachers, of becoming a teacher, that induction of, of teaching, and a group of novices, right, your fellow interns. Um, becoming a member of a club or organization has this same apprenticeship model, right? You have a, a unique language you might be learning with slang and terms that you're, you're learning both tacitly and explicitly the rules that negotiate how you interact with other members of your club. There's a set of explicit rules and then there's also some tacit rules the way that you interact with each other. And similarly with online spaces, think about when you first joined maybe Instagram or I'm showing my age here, Facebook, right? Or whatever, Snapchat, I don't know what you guys use nowadays. Um, and how there are rules of, there's tacit and explicit rules about how people interact with these online spaces. And also there's some sort of learning about what all the different tools in the online space do. And so you have to be maybe taught those explicitly or explore them on your own. And there's, there's, an, there's a learning curve to that. And that, that becomes part of this culturally valued activity perhaps of, of becoming a, a member of this group. So there's lots of examples of culturally valued activities that fit into this model. In fact, Roop would say any type of learning would fit. And I want you to really think about this is really different than um, IPT or social cognitive theory or, or um, constructivism, but I think it's a really powerful model. And when we think about learning in this really culturally sensitive and, and culturally inclusive way, we really are welcoming students to become part of a group of people, whether it's scientists or mathematicians or, or members of a classroom, um, and how we can help structure that so that students feel a part of a community. And I, I really kind of love this as a as a type of learning. So we're getting questions. Um, what, what are the constructs and how do they relate to each other? So thinking about the ways that that um, culturally valued activities um, interact with um, with that cultural context and um, what cultural knowledge really means. Okay, so that was our lecture today. Again, if you have any questions, feel, please reach out to me through email, through chat, um, through um, a phone call. Um, again, I really look forward to hearing from you and I'm excited. Have a great week, guys. Bye.